I'm Dr. Michael Doster, Department of Nuclear Engineering here at North Carolina State University, and I'm going to give a presentation on subchannel math methods that are used for the analysis of nuclear power systems. This is meant to be more of a primer. Uh, this is not meant to be uh, a research-oriented presentation. The, it is primarily to introduce people to the models that are used and how they're used. Uh, it is oriented for people who may not be uh, thermal hydraulic types who run COBRA all the time, but who are going to have to interface and use COBRA. So with that, let me um, go ahead and move on. Uh, again, the purpose of this talk is I'd like to introduce not only students, but practitioners and researchers in the various fields to uh, the theory and approaches that are used in subchannel codes. Or, these codes include COBRA and its various versions, uh, and there are a number of them out there. COBRA TF is the version that has been selected for use in CASEL. It is not the only one out there, but it is one that has been selected for use in CASEL. There's also VIPER, which is an EFRI version of the subchannel code, which is used by many of the industry folks, because uh, again, it was developed under EFRI sponsorship. And that's the one I think that Westinghouse uses, or a variant of fiber. Uh, again, these codes exist in various, a number of different versions. Many utilities or uh, the vendors have adapted them for their own use, put in proprietary correlations that are not available to others. Okay, But none of that matters for what we're going to talk about today. Okay, uh, What we care about is what are subchannel methods, how are they used, what, uh, what are the things that go into them, for example. And one of the things that I would like to do, is, and I'll try to do this over the course of the talk, is identify where these subchannel methods are going to impact other researchers in the, in the various castle focus areas. For example, we have people at BUQ who are going to be trying to run COBRA or, or, make, uh, or, or use it. People in the uh, transport methods, people in the chemistry methods. Uh, there are going to be various places where people are going to have to interface with COBRA in one of the versions. So they should at least have some idea of what's involved here. So this is going to be a talk. I'm going to try and develop the equation sets that are used to give people an idea of where the, what the models look like and what the limitations are. And then where there are places where folks, where it will impact folks, I will again try to, try to point that out. Uh, this is a little busy, uh, but the motivation for these four subchannel methods are a number. Uh, one is, and I'm going to show you a picture of this in just a minute, the flow channels in rod bundles are actually between the rods themselves. Uh, it's not around the rod, it's between the rods. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, a rod bundle associated with the nuclear reactor fuel bundle, whether you're talking about a heat exchanger, uh, you can use these codes to model all of that in, 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 uh, in some versions of it. So the, sub, the, the channels are formed between the rod bundles. And as a consequence of the channels being, con, uh, being between these rods, there are gaps between the rods which allow flow from one subchannel to move to the other and back and forth. So as a consequence of that, you have mixing between the subchannels. And these, so you, uh, if, if there are any differences in the rods that form these different channels, if there's any difference at all, that will result in pressure differences at an axial location at any point, and those pressure differences will result in fluid moving from one subchannel to the next. Now, when it does that, it's going to carry mass, it's going to carry energy, and it's going to carry momentum. And as a consequence of that, the distribution, say, of energy in the channel is going to be a function of how much mixing occurs from one subchannel to the next. So if you have a local flow obstruction, for example, in a channel, it will force fluid to move from that channel to another channel. If you have different heating rates in one channel relative to another, then the difference in the heating rates, just different power distributions in the rods themselves, will result in different density distributions, different velocity distributions, and as a consequence, you will get fluid moving from one subchannel to the next subchannel. 
and I will use channel and subchannel interchangeably. A subchannel is simply that flow channel that exists between uh, that's surrounded by rock. Okay, and again, I'm going to show you uh, a picture of this in just a moment. So again, if you have this flow redistribution fluid moving from one subchannel to another, then what that does is it alters the local um, thermal hydraulic conditions. It changes the density, for example. Uh, density is important for people who are doing neutronics calculations because it affects the moderation that you have. If you have void, pro if you have boiling, then that produces void, and that void distribution also changes the neutron moderation. It changes reactivity. It changes the radiation transport calculations that you do. <coughs> uh, it, calculation of, uh, or the fluid distribution as it, or, or energy distribution changes at what point on the local rod surface you will begin to boil or if you begin to boil at all, which is extremely important for some of the castle challenge problems. For example, crud, they're interested in where does boiling begin. And if you miss boiling where it starts by several feet, for example, or meters, uh, then you have, then you've missed the whole problem. Okay. Uh, if you're, if one of the challenge problems that has been discussed is looking at D and B, departure from nuclear boiling or other critical heat flux. The local fluid parameters will directly impact where and if that occurs. <clears throat> okay. Um, while not necessarily at this point within the Castle project, at some point they are interested in looking at some accident situations such as loss of coolant accidents, loco, or steam line breaks. And in these cases, you can have very large flow asymmetries, meaning that the fluid is moving from one part of the core maybe to another part of the core as a consequence of a pipe break. And you have a large asymmetry in the pressure distribution radially across the core, and that will give you large flow uh, mismatches. Flow distribution. So <clears throat> if we're going to try to calculate these kinds of phenomena, then we're going to have to be able to predict what these cross flows are the flow transfer from one subchannel to another subchannel through the spacing between the rods. And so the subchannel methods are restricted to rod bubble geometries. They are a pseudo three dimensional approach, and I'll show you what I mean by that as we go through this, but they are restricted to rod bubble geometries. Uh, this is not a CFD calculation in its strictest sense. Uh, because you cannot use it to predict, say, three-dimensional flows in an open volume. It will not work for that. The, the methods, the models are derived particularly for rod bundle geometry. Okay. So again, if you've got some large open space, you really cannot predict three-dimensional flow patterns in there using these kinds of approaches. It will not work. So I have illustrated here a subchannel in a rectangular lattice, and I'm going to, uh, the discussion that we'll have today is for a rectangular lattice, even though there's nothing in the development of these equations or applicability of them that requires it to be a rectangular lattice. The equations are identical whether you're talking about a rectangular lattice, a triangular lattice, or any other combination. All you have to do is be able to describe the interconnection of one subchannel to the other. And so here I have indicated the subchannel, which is indicated by K, and it is, in, it is connected to four nearest neighbors. Okay, so I've numbered those J equal one to four. Obviously, if I, this is just, if I have many subchannels, then there are going to be many connections. But in general, any one subchannel is connected to its nearest neighbors. So, for example, in a triangular lattice, it would be connected to its three nearest neighbors. In a rectangular lattice, its four nearest neighbors. And so, and then each of the adjacent subchannels are connected to their nearest neighbors. And you can enclose, for example, here I have shown just a subchannel that is uh, open on all four sides. If I had a canned geometry, such as you might find in a boiling water reactor, then there may be, excuse me, then if I've got a canned lattice, for example, then there may be a wall that would be here, 
And then the sub-channel would be, for example, that area right there. That would be a different side. So you are, the fact that I have indicated this as simply, as with these four rods, does not restrict it. Okay. You can have, again, a sub-channel, which is uh, of this type, and then you would have a corner sub-channel again. This would be a separate sub-channel type there also. So those are all allowed. And again, in the, when you specify the, uh, when you set up the geometry, you specify what the connections are, what subchannel is connected to what other subchannel. That connection geometry is set up, and whether or not it is closed in or not, as I have indicated here. So those kind of geometries can be modeled if you would like. Okay. So again, this, so while I am going to be describing the. Uh, the development of the equations based on this generic sort of tri rectangular lattice, the equations are applicable to all of these other types as well. <clears throat> now, when we talk about cross flows, we're going to be describing two, there's two unique types that are described or, or that are handled in these codes. One is the pressure driven convective flows. Okay. The pressure-driven convective flows that are, that are the consequence of a pressure difference existing between two subchannels at any axial location. So if we have, for example, two subchannels that are immediately connected to each other, if there is a pressure difference, a lateral pressure difference between those subchannels at that point, then you will get a pressure-driven convective flow as a consequence of that pressure difference. Okay, that one is relatively easy to describe, right, and we'll talk about how we do that here in a, in a moment. And these pressure-driven convective flows result in a net mass transfer between the subchannels, okay, and that is the key difference between the two different types. So if I have a pressure-driven cross flow between two subchannels, then there will be a mass there will be net mass transfer between the between those two subjects. Okay? And that mass transfer will carry energy and momentum with it, but there will be also a net mass transfer between those two channels. There is a separate type of cross flow which is included in these models, which is called a turbulent or eddy mixing flow, which does not transfer mass. There is no net mass transfer as a consequence of this flow. So, the, use, the way that I like to describe it is think of a little whirlpool sitting between the channels so that whatever flows in immediately turns around and flows back out again. But as a consequence of that flow in and flow out, there is a transfer of energy and momentum. So even if there were no pressure differential between two channels so that you didn't get any pressure driven flow, if they had different enthalpies or temperatures, if you want to think about it that way, that these turbulent mixing flows would end up trying to equalize the enthalpy distributions across all of the channels. You would not have a hot channel on one side and a cold channel on the other, and they would they remain that way. Because of this turbulent mixing, they would tend to equilibrate between them. So this is a second time of cross flow. So the, the equations contain terms in them which represent these two distinct types of flows, a cross flow. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the, uh, the derivation of the subchannel equations. If you are trying to work with subchannel codes and you look in the manuals, they're going to give you these equations. And so you might as well know where they come from all right, and have some idea of what the, where they And it will also, as a consequence of this, I will point out as we're going through this derivation, what terms might be of particular interest to different folks. For example, if there's a correlation in here, you might want to know, okay, this is a correlated parameter, something that the, the UQ people may want to fiddle with, okay, or look at or altering or modifying, okay? So I'm going to assume, again, to keep, so we can keep the, uh, the algebra down and keep all the, the, the discussion rather simple. I'm going to use single phase flow for this discussion. The extension to two phases is relatively straightforward. Okay, there's no uh, you just apply it to two different phases, and and this is not a 
this is not a discussion of two phase flow models. That's a whole different, <laughs> a whole different seminar. But if you have if you have looked at two phase flow at all, and I think we have people in, in the seminar series who are going to give two phase flow presentations, then the application of those to the subchannel approach is, is straightforward. Okay, it follows the exact same approach to what I'm going to do here. So. I'm going to just do this for single phase flow. If we can't understand what's going on in single phase, there's no way in the world we're going to get it for two phase. Uh, I'm going to use the rectangular lattice that I illustrated below for illustration. Though again, the equations that we're going to develop are going to be, as you'll see, they will have nothing in it which is lattice dependent. So it will have things in it, for example, the distance between the, the subchannels. Okay? It will have in it cross sectional areas, gap spacing that you can use to describe any lattice structure that you want. So all you have to do is say this subchannel is connected to this subchannel in the input. And this, and this subchannel will have certain characteristics, an area, for example. Uh, one of the primary assumptions in the subchannel equations is that the flow is predominantly in the axial direction. So that is an inherent assumption in the development of these, development of these equations. That the and by axial, it doesn't mean necessarily vertical, but axial is the dominant flow direction along the parallel to the water bubble. Okay, so the, by axial flow, I'm going to mean flow parallel to the water bubble is assumed to be the dominant flow in all of this. And that the lateral cross flows are relatively small compared to those. That is an, an assumption that you find inherent to all of these subchannel type codes. Now the other thing that, that is, is inherent in the assumptions are the parameter values that you predict, whether it's density, enthalpy, temperature, velocity. These are the subchannel area average values at that particular axial location. So if I quote a if I predict a density at an axial point within a subchannel then that density represents the area average density over that subchannel. Okay? The, if, I predict, if I predict a velocity in the axial direction at that, for that subchannel at that location, then that is the area average velocity for that subchannel. Okay? So the parameter values, again, represent the subchannel or area average value at a particular axial location. And that is in the radial direction, there is no finer meshing that can be done. The, the mesh is the subchannel that is the smallest in the lateral direction. Okay? You can choose whatever axial mesh generally you want to, but there is no finer meshing than in the lateral direction than on a subchannel basis. Okay? So you cannot go into these codes and subdivide the subchannel. Okay, and predict different parts. Okay. okay. So most of the time, what you see when these co when the uh, when the equations are developed for these is it's a, it's a sort of a classic control volume approach to developing these equations, and that's the one that I'm going to follow. It's, it's physically based. You can, uh, there are much more rigorous ways to go about generating the area average equations. You end up ultimately with the same equations. It's just the definitions of what the average means is different, but they all look the same. So the subchannel then, again, this is for a rectangular subchannel, and the equations that we'll develop are based on a control volume of this form. So again, here, if you look at this area right here represents the contact of the, that's where the rod is in contact with the fluid. Okay. The gaps would be here. Okay. So these surfaces at this point represent, those are the lateral flow surfaces. Okay. Across the flats, if you will. Okay, that's a lateral again, a lateral flow surface. And then this 
big area here that is denoted by A sub K, that big area there is the axial flow area. And then I denoted Z here in the, uh, as, as the axial flow direction, even though, for example, if, the, if Castle ever decided that it wanted to model can-do reactors where the bundles run horizontally, Z would be in the horizontal direction, even though that's the axial flow direction. And so again, we'll walk through this. Uh, we'll do the easiest one first. And again, this, so I have uh, toned this for people who may not be engineers. Uh, they may be uh, wherever the backgrounds. Okay. But uh, certain things we can certainly uh, talk about is a simple mass balance. And the, uh, we're going to take and perform a mass balance on this. And the K here denotes subchannel K. It does not denote an axial location. Okay, so there, there would end up being multiple subscripts if you were to discretize one of these. One would be subchannel K, maybe axial location I in contact with subchannel J. So there's all of this, and I'm not going to include all of that. Again, it can get it can get confusing enough with just the subchat with just the nomenclature we'll have here. But this, when you see a K here, this means this is the subchannel K. So it's, this is going to be a particular subchannel that goes from the inlet to the outlet of that subchannel between a, a number of rods in, in a bundle. And so we'll denote the volume of that subchannel at any of that control volume is just the area associated with the subchannel. And this can be axially dependent. So the area can change as you move up the channel. So for example, if you have rods bowing, you can take that into account if you would like. Uh, so the volume of the, that small control volume that I showed you in the previous slide is simply the area at that particular axial location times some space delta z. Okay? And the simple mass balance says that the time rate of change in the mass within that little control volume is the sum over all the inlet streams of the mass flow rates that come in minus the sum over all the exit streams and the mass flow rates that leave. So time rate of change is equal to what goes in minus what goes out. Okay, that's simple. And what we will then do is we're going to then look at, remember we have two different, or we have several different kinds of flows. We've got pressure driven flows and we've got these turbulent mixing flows. We've got axial flows and lateral flows that are going to have to be included in these different summations. So the Nomenclature that I will use is m dots of k is the axial flow rate in subchannel k. So that's what's moving in the z direction. And then there will be a the pressure driven lateral flows we would define as this w dot prime j comma k. And the way that I do my subscripts is a positive flow in the direction of the subscripts. So a positive flow here would be w dot this would be J2K would be positive. So we would have positive flow here would imply that for subchannel K, we have flow coming positively from J into K. All right? And this is, a, this is the pressure-driven lateral flow per unit length. So this would be multiplied by a length segment to give you the total mass flow rate that's coming across that gap. So if we then <clears throat> go ahead and just write this down. This then represents the axial component of the flow. Okay. What comes in axially is comes in at the lower limit of the sub volume. Think of that as Z. Or if you want to think of it as a computational node, then you and in fact, what you'll find is that these equations are going to look just like the actually discretized equations once we get done with them. Okay? That's what they're going to look like. So this first term represents the inflow and outflow in the axial direction okay, of that control volume. And then this last term represents the net mass transfer associated with cross flows. Okay? And again, this is with the convention that I have shown here, all of these, if 
flow is positive, these, J to K is positive, which means that if the flow is actually from K to J, it would be negative. So you just flip the sign. Okay, flip the sign. You'll notice that there is no turbulent mixing term here because, again, those terms do not there is no net mass transfer associated with them, so they do not appear in the mass equation. They only appear in the energy and momentum equation. And when we do those, you'll see those there. So <clears throat> again, I, this, is, this one's easy. So we simply substitute that term into our mass balance. And at this point, you're almost done. We cast things then into variables that, we, uh, that are of interest. So we, we write the mass in terms of the density times the volume, okay? And the mass flow rate in the axial direction is the density times the velocity V sub K. And again, that, is, that V sub K that I write here is the axial velocity, the velocity in the Z direction in subchannel K at the location Z that we happen to be working. So I make those substitutions. And you end up with these, what is the axially or spatially discretized form of the mass equation. Now again, this applies at any axial node. Okay, so this would be the equation that would be solved at any axial location. So if you want to think about it, you can replace where I have Z here. or where I've got z plus delta z here, if you want to think of that as some i and i plus one and some axial nodalization, that's what that would represent. And the density that I have indicated, and I'll go here, this density, if you want to think about it, would have an i subscript on it also. So it would be subchannel k axial location i. Now, what this looks like if you look at this equation, that term right there, if you divide that by the delta Z, that looks like a standard first order difference. Okay. And most of these codes, that is, in fact, I'm not aware of codes that do not, where they do not treat the axial discretization in this sort of form as a simple uh, first order difference type approach. Okay. So that is that gives you some idea about error order for these codes. Okay. So they're all going to look at like a simple first order. Okay. Uh, uh, in this case, depending on how uh, this would be a forward difference, simple forward difference. Okay. So that's the mass equation, and the same approach is going to be applied there. Now in this equation, there is nothing. There are no empirical correlations. So the only thing that would affect here is what spatial resolution you choose for your axial discretization will affect the solution and what the equation looks like for the prediction of that cross flow term. So if there are the impact of empirical correlations on this equation are going to come only in the equations that are going to give you addition of these additional parameters. Okay. So there's nothing in here, if you want to think about it, to adjust. Okay. Um, I guess it's, I, I'm not sure the background of all of the people here, the, uh, the energy balance is nothing more than a simple application of the first law of thermodynamics that is in any junior level basic engineering curriculum. Uh, and the first law, if, and in most energy equations will have a kinetic energy term and potential energy term, whether you're talking about the first law or not your stoves or whatever, the energy equation will have those. In the engineering applications, particularly when you're looking at rod bundle type geometries, the kinetic and potential energy terms are never significant. Okay? They just are not significant. And so they are almost always, in fact, I'm not familiar with any subchannel code that actually includes them. Those are neglected. 
So the energy balance is based on enthalpy, which is the H term here, internal energy, okay, and then the mass flow rates and so on that we've mentioned before. And this term on the right-hand side, depending on how you want to define it, that is the total heat addition rate to the subchannel. And it can include wall heat transfer, the wall that is transferred directly into the fluid across the heated surfaces. It can also, if you want to, include direct deposition of energy into the fluid at that axial location from other sources, such as in neutronics, neutron thermalization inside the subchannel will directly deposit energy into the fluid at that location. You can include that in this term also. Okay, so it would have, if you want to think about it, it could have two different components, a wall heat transfer term and then an internal generation term associated with, uh, again, in neutronics, it would be neutron thermalization. It could be chemical reactions that result in uh, direct heating of the fluid. If you want to include chemical transport and chemical reactions in the fluid, all of that can go in here. For our purposes, for now, we'll just assume that this is some heating term all right. It will, uh, if you're doing neutronics calculations, then the neutron transport will affect that because the BITS calculates a neutron flux distribution in the coolant at that location, then that will term could be your volumetric heating term that comes directly from the neutronics. So in that sense, there's a direct coupling. In addition, the density distributions affect moderation, which impacts the neutron flux distribution. So all of these are coupled. Uh, if you're talking about this term having a wall heat transfer part, then that will be dealt with in, uh, generally using empirical correlations, but could also, uh, and it will involve solving the heat conduction equation in typically inside of the rod to calculate what heat transfer is from that rod into, into the fluid across that heated surface. So the H terms here are enthalpy, the U term here is internal energy, and internal energy and enthalpy are related by basic thermodynamic relationships. Uh, the enthalpy is the internal energy plus the pressure divided by the density. So if, if you're not a school of thermo, schooled in thermodynamics. The enthalpy is simply this U parameter plus pressure divided by density, we, and pressure and density will show up in the equation later on. So the convective terms have three components. We've already seen two of these in the previous slide. One is the axial flow component that's going to show up. Right? And so that one we've already we dealt with with the maths equation. We have the energy exchange between the subchannels as a consequence of the pressure-driven convective flow. So that one also that mass flow rate, that pressure-driven convective flow we saw in the mass transport, the mass equation also. But then we've got the additional turbulent mixing term, which did not appear in the mass equation, but does appear here now. And so without me going through a lot of uh, details, uh, those three terms I've indicated, you've got the axial flow term, which involves the mass flow rate times the enthalpy. Again, this is flow into the bottom of that area and flow out of the area, uh, uh, top of it. You've got the convective cross flow, and you'll see this H has a star on it, uh, and it, the, that H is either the enthalpy from subchannel J, if the flow is from subchannel J into subchannel K, okay, it would be the enthalpy in the subchannel K if the flow is out of the subchannel. Okay? So the convective flow carrying enthalpy into and out of these subchannels across that gap is assumed to carry the enthalpy of the subchannel, of the adjacent subchannel at that same axial location. That assumes effectively perfectly mixed, perfect mixing inside the subchannel at that location. There are no spatial distributions assumed for the enthalpy distribution in the channel. And again, this is another first order type approximation for, um, for the transport across that boundary. Okay. 
So it's consistent with the spatial difference, in, at least in the axial direction. So the choice of which one you use is based on the sign of this pressure-driven convective flow. Right. In the turbulent mixing term, oops, okay, <clears throat> assume, look, again, there's no net mass transfer, so whatever flows into it in the subchannel as a, uh, in the mass sense, again, flows out again. But when it flows into the subchannel, it carries with it enthalpy Hj. And when it flows out of the subchannel, it carries with it enthalpy Hk. So as it swirls in and out, again, it carries in one enthalpy, it carries out another. And so the effect of this term, even within the absence of any convective cross flows, is to cause the channels to equilibrate in terms of enthalpy. Uh, if you had an infinitely long channel, then eventually what would happen was that everything would come to the same enthalpy distribution at the exit as a, as a consequence of this. Okay? This turbulent mixing term here, that turbulent mixing cross flow, is an empirical parameter. Okay? That is based on empirical correlations. That thing is something that the you will have generally a choice of the model, for one, what turbulent mixing model do you want to use? All right. And then there will be parameters within that correlation that can be adjusted. Okay. Now, whether or not you have access to them is a different issue. But at least if you were looking for something to play with, okay, this is the first parameter that we have seen in terms of empirical correlations that, can, that, you, that uh, you would be able to adjust. It's based on empirical data, measured data. Okay. And how do they determine these? They run the subchannel codes and they compare this. And so the subchannel code itself is some large nonlinear least squares model. And then they fit this model, they adjust that parameter or find a form of that mixing term which gives the best fit for experimental data within the subchannel code that you happen to be running. Okay? So the subchannel model itself is your large nonlinear equation, if you will, that you're doing, let's say, a least square spin on, and that's your fitting coefficient. Okay? That thing right there is your fitting coefficient. That's how it's determined in general, is how they find these things. So again, what that leads to is, uh, and I've gone ahead and done the variable substitutions for mass flow rate and mass to put this in form. So that again is your spatially discretized, and it is discretized in the axial direction for the energy equation. And again, you, uh, the parameters of that you have that would be, for example, adjustable for people who are interested in uh, uncertainty quantification and sensitivity analysis would be that one. And then the other would be, let's assume that this term, and I've broken the heat transfer rate up into a heat transfer rate per unit length times a length. Okay. And so that term right there, if you want to think of it as being the wall heat transfer term, that thing would involve empirical correlations And I have noted that in, in the little comments down at the bottom of this slide. The turbulent mixing term is obtained ex empirically from experimental data, and it is normally correlated in terms of the axial Reynolds number. Okay, so the axial Reynolds number is that Reynolds number based on the axial velocity, and the correlation is in general, it's based on that Reynolds number. And again, it's empirically determined. And similarly, the wall heat transfer term, the one I've indicated here, that term will be will involve heat transfer coefficients that are based on empirical data. And there will be different heat transfer coefficients depending on the heat transfer regime that you're in. So, for example, if it's single phase force convection only, there will be one correlation. If it is mixed boiling, where you have single phase force convection and nuclear boiling, there will be some combination or some other correlation. 
And then if it's simply boiling, then there will be a, a third correlation still. Now, in the current version of COBRA TF, the one that we're using, there is one correlation only that models heat transfer over the entire length and is called the Chin correlation. The problem with the Chin correlation it is it is not applicable to the flow and regimes that we're interested in in CASEL. So at some point that correlation is going to, but it is the only one that is in COBRA TF now. So you cannot choose correlation. There's one, Chin. Okay? And so it's hardwired. There is no option for anything other than Chin in COBRA TF right now, whether it's applicable or not. And Chin is applied over the entire rod bundle. Now the nice thing about Chin is that the Chin correlation has, you can turn on and off different terms of it so that you can use it in the single phase force convection region and in the boiling region, but you can't choose other correlations. You have no choice and you don't have any choice as to how that one is implemented. Okay? And so there's nothing to adjust or in that. Well, if you want access to it, you've got to get access to it through the code itself. Okay? There's no other way to deal with it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. The momentum balance looks very, very similar to the energy balance. You have uh, and you have two of these. We're going to have an axial momentum equation and we're going to have one in the lateral direction. The axial momentum equation is what's going to give you the pressure distribution in the axial direction. And the lateral momentum equation is going to give you, given an axial pressure distribution in adjacent subchannels, then how do you get the lateral flows as a consequence of that? So the axial momentum equation says simply that the time rate of change of the axial momentum is uh, simply the sum of the inlet flows of momentum in the axial direction minus the outlet flows <clears throat> plus the sum of all of the forces which act on the fluid in the axial direction. All right. And let me, I'll go ahead and move through this. Uh, and again, we're going to have three components. You're going to have the axial flow component. You're going to have a convective cross flow component. And you're going to have a turbulent cross flow component. And if, and if you look at the form of these terms, they look just like the energy equation, where now instead of having enthalpies, I've got velocities. That's the only difference. And again, in this one, the, and, and even the way that you determine which velocity is convective from one ch channel to the next, they look just like we did with the enthalpy equation. So if you look at this term, for example, just, I, I put velocities instead of enthalpy. So that's the way it's typically done. Okay. And if you look at the turbulent cross flow, it's done exactly the same way. So the same turbulent mixing term is there. Okay. And one option that, and I think I'll make this comment. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So anyway, the form of that term is exactly the same as the energy transport term. You just put velocity in there instead of energy. And then the forces that act on the fluid, you have pressure forces, okay, which are represented in terms of the pressure distribution axially in the channel. You have wall drag or frictional forces. While I'm not, this is another place where there are correlations. This is the place where there are correlations. This is local losses are things such as entrance and exit losses, losses due to spacer grids, which we certainly have in these rod bundle designs, and there will be empirically determined loss coefficients that are input for those. Those you actually have access to through the input deck. Right. That is one thing you actually have access to is the the local losses, the loss coefficients that are input for, uh, and Murray, let me, uh, you run this, uh, 
that is a fixed constant value for the grid. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So at end, you specify at what axial location these the grid is. You input a fixed. It's called a K value or local loss coefficient for that grid. Okay. And it is treated as a discrete discontinuous change in pressure at that location. Okay. Which says something about the length scale, because grids will be a couple of inches long, maybe, but this occurs at a point. So there will be a step discontinuity of pressure at that location as a consequence of this local loss coefficient. You do have access to those. You can fiddle with them. Uh, as many as there are space grids. Okay, so there will be one loss coefficient per grid, and you do have access to them through the input file. Okay? The other component of the frictional loss is the continuous friction component that is done by a friction, uh, some uh, uh, friction factor correlation, which again is in terms of the axial Reynolds number. And that one, I don't believe you have any options on in Cobra TF. It is a given correlation. You don't, if you want to play with it, you've got to go in and change the actual physical code. You cannot choose which one it is. It can't even choose the coefficients that are in it. Okay. And then you've got a weight term, uh, and that's just your axial, uh, your buoyancy term. Okay. All right, so you put all that together, okay, and then again, this is just the spatially discretized form of the axial momentum equation where these empirical terms show up again are you've got the the turbulent mixing correlation, you've got a, you've got friction and local losses, which will appear here, and there will be correlations for those, and again, you will at least have access to the local loss coefficient. And one thing that um, you will find in some codes is there is a distinction between turbulent mixing momentum transport and turbulent mixing energy transport. And in some codes, they offer the option of modifying that term right there by a multiplier. I do not know whether Cobra TF has that as an option or not. Okay, but you will see that in some codes. Then, so what they'll do is they'll just take the turbulent mixing term and say, okay, there's a momentum multiplier. Okay, and so if if they have that as an option, you might have access to that through the input. All right. All right. Now, the last thing is the lateral momentum equation. Since we have these lateral cross flows that are given, that are the result of pressure differences at an axial location, that is determined by performing a momentum balance across the gap between the two subchannels. And this is going to be written in terms of y. But y here is simply an arbitrary lateral direction. It is not a y coordinate. Okay? So do not confuse if, 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 you're, if you're locked into thinking x, y, z coordinates, do not. Y is simply an arbitrary direction from subchannel J to subchannel K, and it can be pointed in any direction. It's just in the radial plane. Okay? So it could be pointing up, sideways, crossways, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> okay, so uh, do not confuse y with actual y coordinate. It's not. Okay, it is simply the direction laterally, or, or and so you have a lateral momentum control volume. And most of the time, you can, and you can do this more advanced, but it's just fine uh, using a box. Uh, the lateral control volume is simply indicated here, and it is a square or It's a box, okay, as indicated here, okay. And this is the center of subchannel K, and this is the center of subchannel J out here, okay. And you can point this, this lateral momentum balance in any direction necessary. That's why it doesn't matter whether it's a rectangular lattice, a triangular lattice, or whatever, because each of the, the the transport across any particular gap is assumed to not impact the transport across any other gap. Okay, so once you have moved flow from subchannel J to subchannel K, 
If you go to another gap, it does not know that that transport has happened other than whatever the pressure is in this particular subchannel. So there's no J to J, if you will, term. So you can't have a, a, a cross flow term which goes all the way across the subchannel to another subchannel. Okay. Once you cross into subchannel K, the fluid loses any idea of where it came from. And so again, that allows you to write these balances across each gap independent of any other gap or the orientation of any other gap. All right. And so again, here we assume that the, sub, the flow is from subchannel J across this gap into subchannel K. And again, the pressure, the center of subchannel K would be here and would have pressure PK. The center of subchannel J would be located here and have uh, pressure P sub J. And the momentum balance looks exactly the same as for the uh, axial momentum, uh, except now we subscript it with Y. Again, Y is not a coordinate direction, it is simply a, a pointer. Okay. And <clears throat> the mass now. is based on the volume of that box. So the volume is the gap spacing times the center to center spacing L between the subchannel and then the space the width. And this does not have in it, if you look at this lateral equation, nowhere in it does it have the lateral cross flow term W dot prime JK. That doesn't appear in here. So we have to convert these things and these things into the lateral cross flow. And if you expand them such that the mass again is written in terms of the density times the volume of that box times this lateral velocity Vy and you group the density times the Y velocity times the spacing S then that by definition is the lateral cross flow per unit length. And we will use that then to convert all of these terms okay, into the lateral cross plane. <clears throat> so again, in the interest of time, let me move through these fairly quickly. We're about done, but let me go ahead and move through this. So if you write down all of these equations, then you've got the terms associated with axial flow that transports lateral velocity. Okay, so velocity moving axially that moves from subchannel J to subchannel K, if you will. But if you've got some axial velocity that will transport some momentum in the Y direction, you've got lateral cross flows, which also transport then lateral momentum, Y. And then you've got turbulent mixing terms. Now, the reason I don't go into a lot of detail about this is because all of those things is thrown away. Okay. It is assumed, and we, again, we mentioned this earlier in the, uh, in the assumptions for these models, that these lateral cross flows are very low, very small compared to the axial term. So in these terms, you would have a Vy squared term, essentially. In these terms, you're going to have a Vz Vy. And so the assumption is that that Vz Vy is much, much greater than the Vy Vy term. And so you just ignore it. And any turbulent mixing terms are also summarily dismissed. Okay? So they're not even in the model. Okay? And that simplifies the equation significantly. All right? And so now the lateral momentum balance is in terms of the lateral cross flow terms. The forces that we have that act in the y direction, again, assuming that we that our bundles are oriented vertically and not horizontally. There is no buoyancy or gravitational term in the lateral direction. So all you have are the pressure driven, the pressure difference, okay, which gives you the lateral flow. That's your driver right there. It's the pressure difference between the subchannel J and subchannel K. And then you've got the 
resistance to that flow across that gap due to viscous forces wall drag. Now, this is again a empirically correlated. Some codes do not give you the option of they'll model this with a loss coefficient and they'll just fix it in the code. K equals 0.5. And you have, and it's not an input parameter. Now, in Cobra TF, is it fixed like that also? I believe so. Yeah, so you don't even have access to it. There's not even a correlation for it. It's K equals 0.5, and that's it. Okay, so, uh, and it, it would go as this K value, a loss coefficient, times the lateral velocity squared would be the way that it would be employed. So, uh, again, most codes, you don't, you don't have access to that. You can't even change it. It's fixed in the code. So that would give you then your uh, spatially, your again, axially discretized lateral momentum equation. So this would be applied at every spatial node also. Where you have options or potential options for adjusting parameters would only be in that term there. Okay. And, it, and it's not available through the input. So in terms of in Cobra TF anyway, right now. The only thing that you have access to through the input is going to be the loss coefficients associated with the axial momentum. That's it. Through, through the current input structure. No, we've also got that, that chin correlation, right? Well, you don't have any act, uh, you don't, but it's not physical. Or it, it, the correlation was not developed for the pressure and flow regimes that we're currently applying it. So uh, people are aware of this, or we have made it aware to them, and it, it, uh, it is likely going to, or it's going to have to be changed at some point. And when they do so, they may provide options, but it's not going to be short term. You're not going to have it quick. How accurate is it? It's not valid. Right. <laughs> okay. Not that. Yeah. yeah. It was developed for low pressure, high quality. Okay, where you have essentially annular flow, if that means anything. Okay. Where we're looking at is high pressure, low quality, high subcooling, completely different range of parameters. Okay. Uh, so the change, but it is what's in there, and there are no, you don't have any, there's no access to it other than to go into the code itself physically. You can't, there's no parameters to choose. Um, okay, so let me summarize. This is the last thing, and then I, I, we, we can ask as many questions and discuss this as much as you want to. Okay, so in summary, and again, whether you're applying this, whether you're looking at Cobra, Viper, the various versions of Cobra, Viper, the, all of the subchannel codes out there, they're all pretty much based on this same modeling approach. You're going to see slightly different equations, but if you were to go right now and look at any sub-channel manual, you'd be able to look at it and seek equations that are very, very similar to what I've just written there. Okay? Did Relet 5 be sub-channel? No, Relet 5 is not. Okay. Relet 5 is a one-dimensional systems code, okay? So it is not a sub-channel code. What many people do is, do is couple Relap to a sub-channel code to, to get higher fidelity in where you have three-dimensional flows inside the core and where that may be important, then they'll use Relap to provide the inlet and outlet boundary conditions and then Cobra to do the three-dimensional modeling inside. Look, I am not familiar with that one. Uh, maybe someone else who's listening in knows. It's two phase, but I don't know the... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, um, I said the subchannel codes that I'm aware of right now, so Cobra and Viper are sort of the industry standards out there that, should, that, that you'll find. Uh, there may be other ones out there. Uh, uh, GE may have its own version, but Cobra and Viper are these sort of standards that you're, Westinghouse, for example, uses a Viper version. Okay. okay. Um, so the subchannel equations give you local thermal hydraulic information for raw bundles. But by local, I mean it is subchannel area average. So in the lateral direction, the resolution is on a subchannel basis. 
axially you can discretize it whatever what however many nodes you want but again if you're going to be putting in things such as spacer grids and so on that have a two inch maybe width and you're going to model the pressure drop across that with a point discontinuity then going to very fine mesh in a subchannel code in the vicinity of a spacer grid one can question <laughs> whether or not you're modeling that consistent with the physics okay now one of the things that could be done, for example, with CFD codes is all of these empirical correlations, such as loss coefficient, heat the heat transfer coefficient is not modified generally in the vicinity of spacer grids, even though it should be. Now, there is, in some codes, they do have the option to modify the heat transfer coefficient some amount in the vicinity of the spacer grid, but it's essentially the exact same correlation that was developed for open rod bump applied even in the vicinity of the space grid. So that obviously is an area where if you had access to the code, you could modify and look at, okay, what, is, what should it be? You know, what should the correlation be in that range? Okay. But if it provides local thermal hydraulic information for rod bundle geometries, again, that's key. It cannot be used in big open volumes that don't have bundles in it. Okay, it doesn't because everything assumes it flows between these gaps and all the equations are developed that way. So it gives you density, void, temperature, pressure, so on, which uh, would be used in calculating core power distribution. So this information would be fed directly to people doing radiation transport calculations because they need densities, they need voids. Okay? Uh, it gives you temperature, gives you pressure. Uh, if, if you're doing DMV calculations or critical heat flux calculations, it gives you the local enthalpy pressure flows that you need for doing that. These calculus, these codes can tell you at what point you have the onset of boiling. If your heat transfer coefficient is wrong, then you're going to predict the wrong place for boiling begins. Because most correlations or predictions for the onset of boiling are based on some critical wall superheat which means that you have to get the wall temperature right. And if the wall temperature is wrong, you're going to get the wrong location for the onset of wall. So um, they effectively, the subchannel equations effectively couple each subchannel in an assembly or in the core at, at specified axial locations. So if you were to do a full core type analysis with say 50,000 fuel rods, then you would have at each axial location 50,000 unknowns at each axial location. Okay, and as a con now that resolution 50,000 lateral by some number of axial in CFD talk may not be that many. Okay, but it's a that would be a large subchannel calculation. All right, and as a consequence, many times they do just assembly or quarter cores or whatever when they run these. Um, so again, the local parameter values that you get are averages over the subchannel. Okay, so you don't get any spatial resolution within the subchannel. Okay, and so again, it lacks the spatial resolution and the general applicability that you get from CFD type calculations. Um, the single phase subchannel models we've talked to rely on empirical correlations, and we talk about where your know, wall heat transfer, turbulent mixing, wall drag. When you go to two phase then the number of empirical correlations that are involved explode because you've got not only the same sort of correlations for each phase that you have in the single phase, but you also have all of the interfacial interaction terms that occur. Now these again in COBRA TF are hardwired. You have no opportunity to choose them, okay, or to modify them. Okay, they're hardwired. So all I mentioned here is that the two-phase models increase the number of empirical correlations significantly. And anyone who has looked at two-phase models, whether it's subchannel, 1D systems codes, or not know that there uh, that there's a fairly large range of data spread for the correlations that are in these things, even though we understand them fairly well. So with that, I, that's the end of the for, what the formal presentation I made. And again, the the purpose here uh, was to, whoop, there's my boat, uh, <laughs> I don't know we need this.
The purpose of this was to get to provide sort of like a, to give you some idea of how these sub, what the subchannel codes do. No, that was great. Thank you. All right, and, and to and to give you some idea of they couple. If you're doing chemistry and you need local conditions, they're going to couple to the chemistry calculator. Everything that we're doing in Castle is going to be coupled to these sort of calculators at some level or another. So the neutronics, uh, the chemistry, uh, the VUQ, uh, all of this. Uh, maybe the only, the only thing that's not is a fluid structure, and even that might have some coupling. I'm not sure. But there, is, uh, there are opportunities here for doing uh, data assimilation, for doing parameter characterization, for doing sensitivity uncertainty. Uh, the, when the neutronics people are calculating power distributions, they're going to be connected directly to this. Uh, the chemistry people will be connected directly to this. Uh, people who are doing, doing CFD, there is the opportunity to try to replace some of these purely experimentally driven correlations with CFD predicted correlations or maybe modified and sort of CFD uh, uh, <coughs> informed, it was the words that I heard, CFD informed subchannel where the variation in the heat transfer coefficient from the vicinity of the space segments could be computed maybe by, by CFD and then input sent to the subchannel code. Uh, the calculation of the loss coefficient as opposed to being simply empirical. Can we get some better, can we handle it some better way? Um, so, with that, uh, I'll be happy to try to address any questions that anyone has uh, or any comments.